In quantum field theory, the statistical mechanics of fields, and the theory of self-similar geometric structures, renormalization is any of a collection of techniques used to treat infinities arising in calculated quantities. Renormalization specifies relationships between parameters in the theory when the parameters describing large distance scales differ from the parameters describing small distances. Physically, the pileup of contributions from an infinity of scales involved in a problem may then result in infinities. When describing space and time as a continuum, certain statistical and quantum mechanical constructions are ill-defined. To define them, this continuum limit, the removal of the construction scaffolding of lattices of various scales, has to be taken carefully. As detailed below, renormalization was first developed in quantum electrodynamics to make sense of infinite integrals in perturbation theory. Initially viewed as a suspect provisional procedure even by some of its originators, renormalization eventually was embraced as an important and self-consistent actual mechanism of scale physics in several fields of physics and mathematics. Today, the point of view has shifted. On the basis of the breakthrough renormalization group insights of Kenneth Wilson, the focus is on variation of physical quantities across contiguous scales. While distance scales are related to each other through effective descriptions, all scales are linked in a broadly systematic way, and the actual physics pertinent to each is extracted with the suitable specific computational techniques appropriate for each self-interactions in classical physics. The problem of infinities first arose in the classical electrodynamics of point particles in the 19th and early 20th century. The mass of a charged particle should include the mass energy in its electrostatic field. Assume that the particle is a charged spherical shell of radius Re. The mass energy in the field is which becomes infinite as Re zero. This implies that the point particle would have infinite inertia, making it unable to be accelerated. Incidentally, the value of Re that makes equal to the electron mass is called the classical electron radius which turns out to be where is the fine structure constant, and is the Compton wavelength of the electron. The total effective mass of a spherical charged particle includes the actual bare mass of the spherical shell. If the shell's bare mass is allowed to be negative, it might be possible to take a consistent point limit. This was called renormalization, and Lawrence and Abraham attempted to develop a classical theory of the electron this way. This early work was the inspiration for later attempts at regularization and renormalization in quantum field theory. When calculating the electromagnetic interactions of charged particles, it is tempting to ignore the back reaction of a particle's own field on itself. But this back reaction is necessary to explain the friction on charged particles when they emit radiation. If the electron is assumed to be a point, the value of the back reaction diverges, for the same reason that the mass diverges. Because the field is inverse square, the abraham lorentz theory had a non-causal pre-acceleration. Sometimes an electron would start moving before the force is applied. This is a sign that the point limit is inconsistent. The trouble was worse in classical field theory than in quantum field theory. Because in quantum field theory a charged particle experiences Zitterbewegung due to interference with virtual particle-antiparticle pairs, thus effectively smearing out the charge over a region comparable to the Compton wavelength. In quantum electrodynamics at small coupling the electromagnetic mass only diverges as the logarithm of the radius of the particle. Divergences in quantum electrodynamics When developing quantum electrodynamics in the 1930s, Max Born, Werner Heisenberg, Pascual Jordan, and Paul Dirac discovered that in perturbative calculations many integrals were divergent. One way of describing the divergences was discovered in the 1930s by Ernst Stuckelberg, in the 1940s by Julian Schwinger, Richard Feynman, and Shinichiro Tomonaga, and systematized by Freeman Dyson. 
The divergences appear in calculations involving Feynman diagrams with closed loops of virtual particles in them. While virtual particles obey conservation of energy and momentum, they can have any energy and momentum, even one that is not allowed by the relativistic energy-momentum relation for the observed mass of that particle. Such a particle is called off-shell, when there is a loop. The momentum of the particles involved in the loop is not uniquely determined by the energies and momenta of incoming and outgoing particles. A variation in the energy of one particle in the loop must be balanced by an equal and opposite variation in the energy of another particle in the loop. So to find the amplitude for the loop process one must integrate over all possible combinations of energy and momentum that could travel around the loop. These integrals are often divergent, that is, they give infinite answers. The divergences which are significant are the ultraviolet ones. An ultraviolet divergence can be described as one which comes from the region in the integral where all particles in the loop have large energies and momenta. Very short wavelengths and high frequencies fluctuations of the fields in the path integral for the field. Very short proper time between particle emission and absorption, if the loop is thought of as a sum over particle paths. So these divergence is a short distance, short time phenomena. There are exactly three one-loop divergent loop diagrams in quantum electrodynamics. A photon creates a virtual electron-positron pair which then annihilates. This is a vacuum polarization diagram. An electron which quickly emits and reabsorbs a virtual photon, called a self-energy. An electron emits a photon, emits a second photon, and reabsorbs the first. This process is shown in Figure 2, and it is called a vertex renormalization. The Feynman diagram for this is also called a penguin diagram due to its shape remotely resembling a penguin. The three divergences correspond to the three parameters in the theory. The field normalization Z, the mass of the electron, the charge of the electron. A second class of divergence, called an infrared divergence, is due to massless particles, like the photon. Every process involving charged particles emits infinitely many coherent photons of infinite wavelength, and the amplitude for emitting any finite number of photons is zero. For photons, these divergences are well understood. For example, at the one-loop order, the vertex function has both ultraviolet and infrared divergences. In contrast to the ultraviolet divergence, the infrared divergence does not require the renormalization of a parameter in the theory. The infrared divergence of the vertex diagram is removed by including a diagram similar to the vertex diagram with the following important difference. The photon connecting the two legs of the electron is cut and replaced by two on-shell photons whose wavelengths tend to infinity. This diagram is equivalent to the brems trelung process. This additional diagram must be included because there is no physical way to distinguish a zero-energy photon flowing through a loop as in the vertex diagram and zero-energy photons emitted through brems trelung from a mathematical point of view the IR divergences can be regularized by assuming fractional differentiation with respect to a parameter. For example is well defined at P equals a bit is UV divergent. If we take the 3 halves th fractional derivative with respect to minus a2 we obtain the IR divergence so we can cure IR divergences by turning them into UV divergences. A loop divergence the diagram in figure 2 shows one of the several one loop contributions to electron electron scattering in QED the electron on the left side of the diagram represented by the solid line starts out with four momentum p mu and ends up with four momentum r mu it emits a virtual photon carrying r mu minus p mu to transfer energy and momentum to the other electron 
but in this diagram, before that happens, it emits another virtual photon carrying four momentum q mu, and it reabsorbs this one after emitting the other virtual photon. Energy and momentum conservation do not determine the four momentum q mu uniquely, so all possibilities contribute equally and we must integrate. This diagram's amplitude ends up with, among other things, a factor from the loop of the various gamma mu factors in this expression a gamma matrices as in the covariant formulation of the Dirac equation, they have to do with the spin of the electron, the factors of via the electric coupling constant, while the provider heuristic definition of the contour of integration around the poles in the space of momenta. The important part for our purposes is the dependency on Q mu of the three big factors in the integrand, which are from the propagators of the two electron lines and the photon line in the loop. This has a piece with two powers of Q mu on top that dominates at large values of Q mu. This integral is divergent and infinite unless we cut it off at finite energy and momentum in some way. Similar loop divergences occur in other quantum field theories, renormalized and bare quantities. The solution was to realize that the quantities initially appearing in the theories formulae, representing such things as the electron's electric charge and mass, as well as the normalizations of the quantum fields themselves, did not actually correspond to the physical constants measured in the laboratory. As written, they were bare quantities that did not take into account the contribution of virtual particle loop effects to the physical constants themselves. Among other things, these effects would include the quantum counterpart of the electromagnetic back reaction that so vexed classical theorists of electromagnetism. In general, these effects would be just as divergent as the amplitudes under study in the first place, so finite measured quantities would in general imply divergent bare quantities. In order to make contact with reality, then, the formulae would have to be rewritten in terms of measurable, renormalized quantities. The charge of the electron, say, would be defined in terms of a quantity measured at a specific kinematic renormalization point or subtraction point. The parts of the Lagrangian left over, involving the remaining portions of the bare quantities, could then be reinterpreted as counter terms involved in divergent diagrams exactly cancelling out the troublesome divergences for other diagrams. Renormalization in QED for example, in the Lagrangian of QED the fields and coupling constant are really bare quantities, hence the subscript B above. Conventionally the bare quantities are written so that the corresponding Lagrangian terms are multiples of the renormalized ones. Gauge invariance, via award Takahashi identity, turns out to imply that we can renormalize the two terms of the covariant derivative piece together, which is what happened to Z2, it is the same as Z1, a term in this Lagrangian, for example, the electron-photon interaction pictured in figure 1, can then be written the physical constant E, the electron's charge can then be defined in terms of some specific experiment. We set the renormalization scale equal to the energy characteristic of this experiment, and the first term gives the interaction we see in the laboratory. The rest is the counter term. If the theory is renormalizable, as it is in QED, the divergent parts of loop diagrams can all be decomposed into pieces with three or fewer legs with an algebraic form that can be cancelled out by the second term. The diagram with the Z1 counterterms interaction vertex placed as in figure 3 cancels out the divergence from the loop in figure 2. Historically, the splitting of the bare terms into the original terms and counterterms came before the renormalization group insights due to Kenneth Wilson. According to such renormalization group insights, detailed in the next section, this splitting is unnatural and actually unphysical, as all scales of the problem enter in systematic continuous ways, running couplings to minimize the contribution of loop diagrams to a given calculation. One chooses a renormalization point close to the energies and momenta actually exchanged in the interaction. 
However, the renormalization point is not itself a physical quantity. The physical predictions of the theory, calculated to all orders, should in principle be independent of the choice of renormalization point, as long as it is within the domain of application of the theory. Changes in renormalization scale will simply affect how much of a result comes from Feynman diagrams without loops, and how much comes from the leftover finite parts of loop diagrams. One can exploit this fact to calculate the effective variation of physical constants with changes in scale. This variation is encoded by beta functions, and the general theory of this kind of scale dependence is known as the renormalization group. Colloquially, particle physicists often speak of certain physical constants as varying with the energy of an interaction, though in fact it is the renormalization scale that is the independent quantity. This running does, however, provide a convenient means of describing changes in the behavior of a field's theory under changes in the energies involved in an interaction. For example, since the coupling in quantum chromodynamics becomes small at large energy scales, the theory behaves more like a free theory as the energy exchanged in an interaction becomes large, a phenomenon known as asymptotic freedom. Choosing an increasing energy scale and using the renormalization group makes this clear from simple Feynman diagrams. Were this not done, the prediction would be the same, but would arise from complicated high-order cancellations. For example, is ill-defined. To eliminate the divergence, simply change lower limit of integral into epsilon or in epsilon b. Making sure epsilon b, epsilon a 1, then i equals lane a, b. Regularization. Since the quantity infinity minus infinity is ill-defined, in order to make this notion of cancelling divergence is precise, the divergences first have to be tamed mathematically using the theory of limits, in a process known as regularization, an essentially arbitrary modification to the loop integrands, or regulator, can make them drop off faster at high energies and momenta, in such a manner that the integrals converge. A regulator has a characteristic energy scale known as the cutoff, taking this cutoff to infinity recovers the original integrals. With the regulator in place, and a finite value for the cutoff divergent terms in the integrals then turn into finite but cutoff dependent terms. After cancelling out these terms with the contributions from cutoff dependent counter terms, the cutoff is taken to infinity and finite physical results recovered. If physics on scales we can measure is independent of what happens at the very shortest distance and time scales then it should be possible to get cut-off independent results for calculations. Many different types of regulator are used in quantum field theory calculations, each with its advantages and disadvantages. One of the most popular in modern use is dimensional regularization, invented by Gerardis T. Hooft and Martinus J. G. Veltman, which tames the integrals by carrying them into a space with a fictitious fractional number of dimensions. Another is Pauli Villa's regularization, which adds fictitious particles to the theory with very large masses such that loop integrands involving the massive particles cancel out the existing loops at large momenta. Yet another regularization scheme is the lattice regularization, introduced by Kenneth Wilson, which pretends that our space-time is constructed by hypercubical lattice with fixed grid size. This size is a natural cutoff for the maximal momentum that a particle could possess when propagating on the lattice and after doing calculation on several lattices with different grid size, the physical result is extrapolated to grid size zero, or our natural universe. This presupposes the existence of a scaling limit. A rigorous mathematical approach to renormalization theory is the so-called causal perturbation theory, where ultraviolet divergences are avoided from the starting calculations by performing well-defined mathematical operations only within the framework of distribution theory. 
The disadvantage of the method is the fact that the approach is quite technical and requires a high level of mathematical knowledge. Zeta function regularization Julian Schwinger discovered a relationship between zeta function regularization and renormalization using the asymptotic relation as the regulator lambda infinity. Based on this, he considered using the values of zeta to get finite results. Although he reached inconsistent results, an improved formula studied by Hartle, Garcia, and based on the works by E. Elizalda includes the technique of the zeta regularization algorithm where the b's are the Bernoulli numbers and so every i can be written as a linear combination of zeta, 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 or simply using a bold planner formula we have for every divergent integral, valid when m greater than zero, here the zeta function is Hurwitz's zeta function and beta is a positive real number. The geometric analogy is given by to evaluate the integral so using Hurwitz's zeta regularization plus the rectangle method with step h. The logarithmic divergent integral has the regularization for multi-loop integrals that will depend on several variables. We can make a change of variables to polar coordinates and then replace the integral over the angles by a sum so we have only a divergent integral that will depend on the modulus and then we can apply the zeta regularization algorithm. The main idea for multi-loop integrals is to replace the factor after a change to hyperspherical coordinates f so the uv overlapping divergences are encoded in variable r. In order to regularize these integrals one needs a regulator for the case of multi-loop integrals. These regulator can be taken as so the multi-loop integral will converge for big enough s using the zeta regularization we can analytic continue the variable s to the physical limit where s equals zero and then regularize any uv integral by replacing a divergent integral by a linear combination of divergent series which can be regularized in terms of the negative values of the Riemann zeta function zeta.